All right. A little scarier without that barrier, isn't it? All right, let's do it. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nick Thornburg, and when I'm not dressed like Carl Sagan, I'm a senior chemical engineer at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, also an adjunct professor of chemical engineering at the Colorado School of Mines. Today, I'm going to be telling you about ammonia, which is a synthetic fertilizer that may one day power our planet. But first, we're going to go back to the dawn of the 20th century, when humankind was facing an existential crisis, the looming threat of mass starvation. And there was a call out to the world's scientists to come up with a formula for synthetic fertilizer. Two scientists from Germany, Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, cracked the code and came up with a way of making synthetic ammonia at a massive industrial scale. And this invention led to change the course of history as we knew it. Its discovery enabled technology that could feed billions of people, but it also had a dark side to it. It was also used to develop the world's first chemical weapons that were used in two world wars and were responsible for the deaths of millions of people. This duality is something that we see a lot with ammonia. And fast forward 110 years to today, 50% of the world's population, 4 billion mouths on this planet, are fed using food grown by ammonia fertilizer. And 50% of the nitrogen atoms in each of your bodies comes from this process. It's quite literally inside all of us, and it's hurting the planet. One ton of ammonia produces three tons of carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere. And this process is so massive, so gargantuan, that it consumes 2% of the world's energy supply just to make one commodity chemical. It's even worse when you look at where ammonia is made, where it's stored, where it's shipped, and where it's used. And it aligns almost nowhere with the major population centers and the agricultural needs of the developing world. It's an equity crisis along with an energy crisis. And it challenges us tonight here at Switch to rethink the paradigm. Do we really need to be making chemicals in gigantic factories like this? Or can we delocalize and decentralize the production of chemicals to bring them closer to the people who need them the most? And tonight we're gonna to talk about how to do that. But before, we have to acknowledge how difficult this problem is. Why is this chemistry so challenging? Well, a big part of it has to do with nitrogen, 78% of the air we breathe, being a really stable molecule. That's a good thing for our existence, but it's a challenging thing in terms of making fertilizer. Requires a lot of energy to break it, which brings us to our first life lesson of thermodynamics, which is if you want to break something, you're going to have to pay for it. And it costs a lot of energy to break apart nitrogen. But things like electrochemistry, allow us basically to lower the cost of that energy barrier. It unlocks possibilities to make ammonia using renewable energy resources. It also helps tip the scales of the challenging thermodynamics of that chemical reaction. It allows us to make more ammonia, more of what we want. But electrification isn't all gravy either. And what you should expect when you're electrifying is the second life lesson of thermodynamics, which is that electrons are a lot like kids. And 99% of the time, they don't do anything that you want them to do. <laughs> This is a challenge as we start looking to scale these things up. But where the rubber meets the road with electrification of these processes is a concept called modularization. It allows us to shrink down chemical manufacturing to fit inside of trailer truck compartment sized containers that you could dock next to a farm, next to agrivoltaics, next to wind turbines, next to these stranded renewable resources, and create fertilizer when and where you need it, and only requiring things like air, water, and renewable electricity to make it. This is how we democratize chemical production and bring it back to the people. But the challenges with this are just on the front end of making it in the first place. We can also look about some of the easier aspects of, aspe or of accessing ammonia's energy content when we look at it as a vector for hydrogen. This is where ammonia becomes much more than just a fertilizer. The third life lesson of thermodynamics is that sometimes things work out the way you want them to. And in this case, breaking ammonia apart back into its base elements like hydrogen is a lot easier than making it in the first place. NREL is looking at putting this whole picture together, trying to understand the whole ecosystem of building a future ammonia energy economy. We want to understand not just how every single node on this map works, but also how they're interconnected, what this entire energy ecosystem looks like, and how it can become technologically and economically viable. And making renewable ammonia using electrons is just the first part of this. It's one piece of the puzzle, but it's something that could unlock an entire revolution in chemical manufacturing and in the way that we look at our energy economy. 
The last technical concept that I want to leave you with tonight is the concept of circularity. We talk a lot about the circularity of carbon atoms, but we have to also look at nitrogen and hydrogen atoms. This is a very important cycle when we look at replenishing these resources and utilizing energy in the most effective way possible. The last concept that I want to leave you with tonight is one from the heart, which is one that what we plant now, we will harvest later. Thank you so much for your time and attention tonight. I look forward to speaking with you at the break. Thank you.